Well, thanks for the opportunity to plug my book. It came out in October. It's uh, not long, but the print is small. I think they're trying to save the trees. Um, it came about because I got a telephone call from an acquisitions editor of another publisher. The publisher who accepted the proposal is Lexington Books. The other, uh, other publisher, um, acquisitions uh, editor, said he wanted to start a series in prominent business figures. He suggested people like Steve Jobs and Yves Saint Laurent and so on. And I told him they were still alive and I'd prefer not to be sued for libel, so I'd rather do somebody who's good and dead. <laughs> and we settled on our Andrew Carnegie. And I spent a couple of months of spare time writing the proposal, submitted it. He took it to the editorial board, who killed the whole idea of the series. <laughs> so being an economist and recognizing my error, I nevertheless took account of the sunk costs. And I submitted the proposal to another publisher, Lexington, who immediately accepted it and sent me a contract. So that's why I wrote the book. In the process of researching for the proposal, I read the major uh, biographies of Carnegie. James Bridge, 1903, Inside History of Carnegie Steel. De uh, Joseph Walls, 1970, Andrew Carnegie. David Nassau's, 2006, Andrew Carnegie. And I was impressed with how economically ignorant the authors of those books were. Uh, they really couldn't appreciate Carnegie and other than his personal life. So those books are great to read if you want to know about all of his personal life. But if you want to know why he was an important figure in economics, read my book. As far as I know, it's the only book on Carnegie by a libertarian Austrian economist. Uh, I do also recommend you read Jonathan Hughes, The Vital Few. He has a chapter on Carnegie that's very informative, but in a more general form. Uh, he tries to place Carnegie in his context and his contributions to progress. Uh, my approach is to view Carnegie as an economic actor whose alertness uh, to profit opportunities and his success in dealing with uncertainty uh, in his, in his profit-seeking efforts uh, had positive and negative effects for economic coordination in the U.S. economy in the 19th century and in the world economy also, since he became the largest steelmaker in the world eventually. The first chapter of the book summarizes the main theories of entrepreneurship and opts for Israel Kirzner's uh, theory that entrepreneurship consists of being alert to profit opportunities that others don't see and taking actions that subsequently more closely coordinate the actions of all people participating in the market. Uh, the book is roughly chronological, and it relates Carnegie's rise from a poverty-stricken childhood in Scotland to becoming the majority partner and the largest steel manufacturer in the world. And the merger of Carnegie Company, as it was at that time before, uh, after Carnegie Steel, the merger with several other companies to form U.S. Steel, the first, world's first billion-dollar corporation. Um, I also deal with Carnegie's philosophical, uh, I'm sorry, ph philanthropic adventures, uh, which are interesting in themselves, as you all know. Um, many of the attendees here participate in the TIAA CREF uh, retirement uh, <clears throat> uh, fund for college professors, and Carnegie is the one that started that, uh, among other things. He was successful because he was highly intelligent, he was ambitious, he was unscrupulous when he thought it was necessary, and he had outstanding entrepreneurial talent. He also used or took advantage of political and governmental means to divert resources from other uses into those uses that, that were profitable for him and his partners. In other words, he was a outstanding crony capitalist as well. Most notably, he lobbied and bribed to maintain protective tariffs for iron and steel products throughout the 19th century. He did not institute those tariffs. He was not instrumental in getting them started. They started back at the beginning of this nation. Um, but he worked very hard to sustain those tariffs high enough that they were basically prohibitive. 
He was also given that context. Within the context, he was fiercely competitive with other companies in all of the companies he owned. He was very concentrated on cost cutting and innovation of the latest techniques in the producing the products that he produced. And he focused on producing the highest quality products that were technologically possible at the time. So the guy was a real mixture. On the one hand, he, what he did was pernicious because he diverted resources away from more uh, um, <clears throat> um, uses that, that were uh, more efficient in a cost sense into his own, into his own use of those. And he built that uh, industry. The chapter in the book on labor relations on Carnegie is particularly different from the usual approach by labor-friendly historians, especially when presenting and analyzing the homestead uh, lockout and strike. Most historians look at that and tend to take a highly favorable union view. Uh, I do not do that. Uh, <clears throat> from contemporary accounts, it seems to me that a lot of the motivation for the strike that occurred after the company's lockout uh, was a result of mistaken views on the theory of value and on theories of pricing. The union people were truly in the, uh, in the tradition of Adam Smith and Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, and believing that labor theory of value and labor theory of pricing. Uh, they were completely unaware of, uh, it had, just hadn't trickled down to them of the marginal revolution and the subjective theory of pricing. So what this did was it turned them into criminals. And for many of them, it destroyed their lives and left them and their families destitute. Lastly, there's an irony in Carnegie's philanthropy. He had a key principle which he expressed in the Gospel of Wealth for why he was wanting to do philanthropy. And it was to do for others what he had done for himself. He wanted to help those who will help themselves. And that's why he endowed libraries, colleges and universities, museums, concert halls, parks, and so forth. His focus was he wanted to stimulate people like him to get up on their hind legs, be ambitious, and make something of themselves. After his death, the people he chose to run his uh, foundations, particularly the Carnegie Foundation of New York, turned it around 180 degrees and turned uh, the foundation into a policy-orienting institution, a policy-originating institution dedicated to social engineering, which um, he would have definitely <laughs> not wanted done. He rose very quickly because he saw early that uh, he needed a mentor, somebody that, that could teach him, because he had four years of, of elementary school education, and every other bit of his education was self-taught. So he attached himself very early to Thomas Scott, who was at that time uh, one of the key figures in the Pennsylvania Railroad, and he worked for that railroad for 20 years, well, 15. And <clears throat> we don't know exactly what Scott taught him because railroad historian Richard White has characterized Scott as, quote, not so much tainted by corruption uh, as impregnated with it. <laughs> <laughs> but if you read Carnegie's self-serving autobiography, you will not learn any of that aspect of Thomas Scott. He praises Thomas Scott. And yet the man that did the most to build his company Henry Clay Frick receives two small mentions in Carnegie's autobiography. Uh, <clears throat> their relationship was one that was extremely interesting, and I explore it uh, thoroughly. Uh, Frick, early on, became a in the, in the 1880s became one of Carnegie's partners because Frick had the largest coal and coke manufacturing enterprise in the Pittsburgh area, and eventually in the United States. And Frick and he made a, 
uh, quite a team uh, during the last uh, 20 years or so of Carnegie's business uh, activities. But they came to clash with one another because Frick, unlike Carnegie, was a man of his word, a man who was honest, straightforward, who told people what he would do and did it. And Carnegie uh, tended to change what he did as the opportunity presented itself if it was, if he thought it was necessary. Well, that's an outline of it. The publisher, um, Lexington, is offering it at a 30% discount here. At, if you uh, take one of the flyers away from this uh, conference, uh, and that's the end of my flogging. Mark, thank you.